Okay, before we get things started, we're going to have guest uh, Joe Lawler, Lawler, ah, Joe Lawler uh, start off the show with uh, just the main areas in which uh, Martin Campbell's appeals. So, welcome. And Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, where did Campbell fit into your world? Was it his James Bond movies, or was it yeah. his like blockbusters? I mean, like the first, uh, I think the first film of his that I saw was Goldeneye. Okay, and uh, you know, and, and like I liked James Bond. I was a teenager though, and it kind of you know <laughs> felt like you know kind of revitalized the uh, James Bond brand. Uh, um, you know, with Pierce Brosnan seeming like you know, a little less of a, you know, grandfather as James Bond, like, you know, having watched all the old 60s ones and stuff like that. Right. So it was, uh, you know, uh, I thought that was awesome. And then, uh, you know, a couple years later, uh, The Mask of Zorro, which was a mega hit, also felt I just, lost uh, you know, track like, of how many people went as Zorro for Halloween. <laughs> yeah, yes. And it was like, as a kid, I had been a fan of Zorro. I don't know, like, what, uh, you know, I can't even think of where, where exactly my exposure to Zorro had first started. But, you know, it's this sort of like Batman adjacent character, uh, you know, inspiration for Batman, of course. But like, as a kid, you know, it was like all wearing all black and wearing a, and a mask. It's uh, it seems like a sword that seems like someone i want to be watching so and like you know like i had i loved uh uh desperado a couple years earlier so seeing antonio banderas playing uh zorro seemed like a (laughs) natural time and uh i guess uh you know i mean uh, anthony hopkins is always great i don't know how believable he is as like a spaniard but (laughs) still it was (laughs) It worked. I had some Latino pals who were okay with it. They're like, hey, it doesn't work, but it does work. It's a Sean Connery thing. I love yes. you in the role. Therefore. And uh and then like I don't know, I didn't see Vertical Limit. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen it. It was but, always one of those I would see parts of and yeah, you know, talk it, smack it, about. And then when I finally saw it, it was like, meh, it's yeah, disposable, it, 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 but hardly an offensive movie. Yeah, it's the sort of like Saturday afternoon on TNT or TBS type of movie. Yeah, totally like, what it is. Yeah. Like, all right, it's acceptable. It's not, you know, it's not bad. It's not great. It's just middle of the road. Yeah. Um, Genre piece. It, uh, like, my next big exposure with him was uh, The Legend of Zorro. I thought and, it was going to uh, be Green Lantern. <laughs> well, I'll, <laughs> I'll get there. But, like, my big. Uh, in like the mid 2000s i was writing some movie reviews for the local paper and oh awesome uh, fucking dope. and <laughs> it was fun uh but then i i went and saw the legend of zorro and everything that i felt was good about mask of zorro just like fell flat in legend of zorro and really it's the only... like they just worried about the stunts nothing else yeah really <laughs> and because it was like it's like zorro is dealing with uh, you know it's like mexican politics and all this stuff and so the only thing i really remember about that movie was my headline and, for the review which was zorro more like boro and, <laughs> uh, and which we came up it was like 10 minutes before we had, went to print i was like wait i know what i want to go with because usually i would just like let the headline like copy editors come up with whatever <laughs> they wanted but for that one i was like wait i i have a strong opinion on this and and of course and then but he redeemed himself the next year with Casino Royale. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, it's like after, like, it's an, imp- I think it's kind of a uh, impressive, uh, you know, to have, like, basically relaunched the James Bond franchise twice. Oh, yeah. And I had, like, done it so differently, where it's like Casino Royale, you know, it's coming off uh, the, like, clearly influenced by the success of like batman begins and you know kind of going back to basics and yeah before we were doing we're, new lens flare re- star trek yeah. and all these other reboots yeah. it's like we just that was kind of the go-to everyone was going to the batman begins casino royal handbook yeah and so like at that like 
at that point, you know, it's like his hits were outnumbering his misses. And it's like to have, you know, relaunched Bond twice, to have, uh, you know, kind of revitalized any of his TV work. No, and that was, I was looking over that because he's got that big gap between uh, films where I assume he was just uh, like making TV in the UK mostly. And I saw like a few. Yeah, they were big on like PBS, BBC type Mm. shows, just Rally Ace of Spies and the original Edge of Darkness before he held the remake movie years later. Yes, which is also one that I have not seen uh, the film version of Edge of Darkness. Is it worth seeing? <laughs> It'll be a like it or hate it. I, I think the sure. issue was it was just too dark for a mainstream audience. And mm-hmm. then Mel Gibson's scandal happened. So then it was pretty much it was one of those people <laughs> were liking it. It was one of those. I saw it, but I didn't feel good after it. So I just didn't sure. come back to it like another. I mean, I don't have to feel good, but it just didn't feel as I just feel like both the writer, William Mana. Again, you know, his dialogue always sparkles, but he, mm-hmm. he's done better grim work. And I just felt like, I don't know, this is decent. But, you know, after even seeing this miniseries, I don't feel like it really holds a torch to it. It's just a different version of the story. <laughs> sure. But then, of course, Green Lantern, which, all right, going back to like, you know. He <laughs> like Mike Shyamalan, the last <laughs> airbender, he got locked out of the <laughs> editing room. And... I, I was I was seeing a funny blur where he was critiquing Quantum of Solace, but they had it as Green Lantern director hates the new James Bond. <laughs> well, it was so like I was like when I first like the first previews I saw for uh, Green Lantern, I was like thinking you know this could be good. I'm a, a kind of a DC guy at heart, and I like Ryan Reynolds, Pennyworth, and Gotham for the win. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and then I was like, well, you know, it's the guy who made Goldeneye, the guy who made Casino Royale. It's like, there's a chance this will be a good movie. And then mm-hmm. I went and saw it, and it was just this. My sister I... and mother both saw it. And then a month later, they're like, oh, yeah, we did see that. It was <laughs> terrible. And it was one of those, just like, they kind of just took them to soak it in. They didn't think it was as bad as the press sure. release, but the. The shit, the the stank caught up to him eventually. Well, yeah, because it it seemed like I mean clearly they were going for like a a Marvel feel, but Iron and, Man and space. yeah, and like, and it's almost kind of surprising that Martin Campbell didn't end up like he's he seems like the kind of director that Marvel would have had for like one of their Phase One movies. Where he's the kind of you know yeah at one point or another they wanted anyone who had done a big blockbuster to helm one of their movies. He apparently he said he's he's not invited to Eider Camp anymore. No, no. He said in a Reddit he didn't give details. And I'm like yeah I I guess that makes sense. But he's just like you know it like I mean because he's not he's like you know kind of like journeyman director where he's not like an auteur um, like you know. Like, I mean, like M. Night Shyamalan or uh, uh, <laughs> Christopher Nolan like, type so guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you think, I mean, he's the kind of director who's, you know, very competent and, you know, will give you some good action scenes and probably gets things done on budget and things like that. Mm-hmm. But he's also not someone that you are like, oh, you know, visionary director Martin Campbell. <laughs> but, you know, but he's also not you know like neil he's not Green workman like, like, like a richard flesher or uh i don't know he's not a wannabe of richard donner even mm-hmm. uh, I, yeah i would re- so here's the question would you rank him up with maybe the other antoine fuqua's jonathan mustows or even just other guys who are kind of just the go-to guys just show a hero getting their hands dirty get a good performance and have some decent set design <laughs> Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's like, you're not going to, for the most part, feel like good genre piece. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's like, (laughs) this will sound like an insult, but it's like, you know, it's a little dated here, but like the kind of movies where it's like, you see it at Redbox and you're like, all right. Yeah. uh, You know, there's a, 
an actor that I'm uh, familiar with. Oh, it's the guy who did some movies that were good. You know, I'll check that out. So it's like any, and you know, it's like the foreigner is like right on that level where it's like two actors, uh, uh, Pierce Brosnan and Jackie Chan, who you know, but are also a little past their prime. But they're also, you know, taking chances with that movie and kind of playing against type. And he always you know, has like, characters just like an unusual roles. So I think that yeah. just, he, he lets them do that without re- relying on them to carry the movie. And I take it you saw the protege and memory. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And like, although I saw it, at like, and, you know, I didn't see it all that long ago, but I don't know. It's not, it hasn't stuck with me that much, but it's one that like, Friday, Saturday night slugfest. Yeah. You know, it's like if it if it comes on, I'm not gonna change the channel or something, but the bigger you know. the scale, the more freedom it gets, the less of the scale, then it's just kind of a one time rental. Yes, yes, exactly. And like and like and again, like has memory been released yet? I have not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a while. I've not I, seen that. I saw it on a uh, plane and was very entertaining and, and I think the issue is it came out at like the worst possible time people are just like people are oversaturated with every other superhero franchise or giant blockbuster franchise where they're like no more Fast and Furious or Star Wars <laughs> even if they haven't seen the good ones of any franchise is like that I, that's kind of how they are with William Neeson they're like hey you know I already saw his last five good or bad movies yeah. and the issue is he's not a you know it's kind of a dual character uh, deal. You know, Guy Pierce is as much the star as he is mm-hmm. as the FBI agent. And, but it's not a typical like heat or collateral thing where good versus evil. It's actually just pretty much one giant deal of two unlikely people taking down a trafficking ring. And it's, it's inspired by a French movie called Memory of a Killer from O3 mm-hmm. that was often compared to Leon the Professional and Born Identity. And, uh, this just is kind of, you know, you don't have to see either version to really get this one, but it's just, I, I was just overjoyed with how different it was. How it's like, okay, I got plenty of surprises and they felt earned. Yeah. And I, I'd say it's a sleeper. Obviously, I don't, I wouldn't put it as like, you know, a best of the year movie, but a solid action crime mystery nonetheless. Sure. And, and that's, it sort of like blends into the, you know, it's like Liam Neeson has, like ever since taken has like so many of these roles where you know he's like, like all the 70s and 80s actors yeah we working for canon films as well as yes. just drive-ins <laughs> saw it, it, you saw it you didn't you didn't yeah and it like just you know it's like there's like you know the level of competency there where you know going in that it'll be entertaining uh and everything but you know, it's like also, you know, it's like, well, there are like 15 other Liam Neeson movies kind of like this. You know, am I going to go out of my way to check it out? <laughs> Probably if it's on TVS or yes, USA. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and it's like, if it pops up on Hulu or something, uh, you know, I'll add it to my watch list and probably check it out some night. But <laughs> not, you know, I'm not going to pay t- like an extra four bucks on Am- whatever on amazon probably to check it out <laughs> it's fair too we're all trying to you know if we're not cutting the cord or getting rid of streaming then we're trying to find ways to just save other money yes it's like i know eventually i'll be able to watch it for free so i'll hold off for now <laughs> nice and i was like i was curious and i don't know if anyone else has talked about this but like his because he definitely reinvented himself during those tv years because he started out with like a series of sex comedies which yep. i've seen none of but i don't think anyone really has yeah. <laughs> it's like but i, I kind of wonder like how someone goes from that to like james bond and like i mean i think you know, the tv he had just helped him out and sure he was finally given a chance <laughs> <laughs> Sure it's like you know wonder like you know maybe in another world there's like some universe where martin campbell is like 
the Russ Meyer of the 1980s or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I was actually thinking that in my mind. Oh man. You just kept going down that route and but yeah. <laughs> but now I kind of I'm curious if Eskimo Neil is a uh, or Eskimo Nell. I can't remember what it is. Nell. Yeah, it, maybe that's streaming somewhere. I'll have to check it out. I don't know. <laughs> From Severin Films, <laughs> I'm coming to Blu-ray this month. Oh wow! All From right. Shot back. I'm just kidding. Oh no, dang it! All right. Well, <laughs> I'm sure it's a collector's item out there. Probably. Yeah. You can. Uh, yes find it on ebay for 120 bucks or something <laughs> it's very specific what do you yes i not that i've been searching it's a... <laughs> well this has been cool having you on here for this quick uh blur yeah. uh anything you would like to promote in any way shape or form um uh if you are a uh if you're looking to be a student somewhere middle school the best plit no i don't know <laughs> i'm a teacher now so uh well, i don't have a whole lot to promote i've educating got educating everyone yes so get an education if you have children send them to school Come i can't to class. Not. but actually i've got a, a blog uh live local man.com that i don't update very often but sometimes i do so we'll return after these messages do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between goku and superman Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always am I the winner. (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America versus Darth Vader, Solid Snake versus the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop versus Terminator, and even the Muppets versus Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. We let things pile up in the DVR. We add them to our queues. We wait for the DVDs and Blu-rays. We time shift. The Time Shifters podcast. Sci-fi, horror, fantasy, superheroes, comedy, action, film, television, maybe some not-so-current events. Find us on iTunes or at timeshifterspodcast.com. Cool thing about Blind Knowledge is we are in multiple countries. We are worldwide all across the globe. We are in the U.S. We are in the U.K. We are in Canada, Germany, India, Japan. We're in Australia, y'all. Blindknowledge.com. Now back to the feature presentation. Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. Once again with me, I got Mark Shaver and John Marks. Hi, you two. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Hi. Hey. <laughs> Mark and John. All right. So, once again, we're just tackling a uh, crowd-pleasing filmmaker, how they evolve in their body of work. We got all kinds of stories. I'm more familiar with his TV work. Mark can talk for hours about his blockbuster movies, and John was fortunate enough to... <laughs> look at a reddit that he did about a year ago <laughs> oh I, yeah mm-hmm. i remember that one oh, okay i, <laughs> when I the missed protege it came out yeah yep. mm-hmm. so we are discussing new zealand filmmaker martin campbell best known for helming two of the best known james bond movies golden eye for chris brosnan casino royal for daniel craig as well as individual other blockbusters he has helmed he started off his career doing four individual sex comedies and then moved into the legal thrillers, criminal law, and defenseless. Uh, he did uh, other blockbusters such as No Escape, The Mask of Zorro films with Antonio Banderas, 
beyond borders, vertical limit, edge of darkness, uh, which was based on the miniseries from the 80s that he had also helmed a great acclaim. He was locked out of the editing room for the superhero movie Green Lantern starring Ryan Reynolds and then rebounded with the IRA Revenge uh, movie starring Jackie Chan and Pierce Brosnan called The Foreigner. He did the Maggie Q, Michael Keaton, and Samuel L. Jackson's Spy Revenger, The Protégé, and most recently remade Memory, the French film Memory of a Killer as 2022's Memory, starring Liam Neeson, Monica Belushi, and Guy Pierce. So he is also best known for helming individual episodes of the British spy show The Professionals, earlier season one episodes of homicide life on the street uh the 80s acclaimed spy show riley ace of spies he did half of the 12 episode run which is very impressive it started then partially known actor known only as sam neil he has done individual pilot episodes of 10 8 officers on duty last resort and killer woman and is currently working on an update of Blake 7, the cult 70s sci-fi show. So welcome all. Thank you for having me again. Good to be here. Yeah, this was fun. So this is wild how whenever his name is brought up, people will often just like individually ask, who's a action blockbuster guy who can do some drama and can give us the goods and often i see him brought up especially when people want a gritty blockbuster or a no-nonsense kind of movie i I see him on the same list as others like antoine fuqua dins vanav uh uh, just some of these other guys uh, john mcturnan so he's often just one he's just brought up i've just always seen him in individual interviews often for the james bond movies and it seems like he's just one of the few who, other than Green Lantern, no one's ever made into an internet punching bag. <laughs> Pretty rarity. <laughs> Very true. Uh, so, uh, Mark, what was your introduction to Mr. Campbell? Well, like most people, it was Goldeneye, or pro- probably most people, I should say. Um, yeah, first big British-American one. I mean, No Escape did okay but it was mainly a vhs one it flopped at the box office <laughs> um yeah you know that that's one of them i haven't seen yet um, oh really okay oh, yeah, i haven't okay. seen it. I, i've wanted to see it I, I believe there's a blu-ray coming out in three oh, weeks really? actually it's already out in, in three weeks it comes out three weeks okay uh, who, yeah who's doing the remaster shout i think it's unearthed films something blue underground the unearthed films that's what okay let's see no escape blu-ray 1994 no not the other pierce brosnan (laughs) no escape blu-ray okay also known as escape from absalom nationally okay blu-ray.com does not specify when it's coming out It's supposed to be the 18th I remember reading in October. I well, see. I'm, I'm it's sure Umbrella you... Corporation. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not to be confused with the Resident Evil company, but yeah, Umbrella <laughs> Entertainment. Yeah. And it's under the Escape from Absalon, and it's the region free. Yeah. That, they're a pretty yeah. cool Aussie company that, much like uh, what's Arrow, has been really good at making region free releases that people can buy. Yeah. have you seen the film oh yeah Man, way back in college i was a big b-movie guy i was getting into all kinds of weird action sci-fi horror stuff and if i liked an actor i would do my best to see as many of their big movies as i could and rapid share and mega upload was a big help so i i saw this one and i was like i couldn't not see it it also had you know lance henriksen and ernie hudson and Stuart Wilson in a very villainous role. You might know him from Lethal Weapon Free and Mask of Zorro. So there you go. Uh, wasn't you see, he also, correct me if I'm wrong, um, wasn't he in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3? I I don't know, but I <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, so this movie, 
new escape was kind of a it was kind of mocked but it's often been pretty well liked by those who like similar stuff like fortress and the running man and it nowadays when people review it they'll joke how the aliens look like the one the silos from freaking battlefield earth <laughs> uh but yeah it was produced by gail and heard you know was married to james cameron so that's some good production value and okay uh, I, th- I think it's pretty well liked by Ray Liotta fans just because he's a no-nonsense guy who escapes a futuristic prison. And <laughs> I know when he was interviewed, what was it, for that Sopranos movie, he mentioned how much that was one of his favorite films that he did. Maybe someone said that. To interview oh. him. That's good to know because you see so many who they would kind of act like an NBA star or a rapper. If something didn't sell or make a hurt, then they would instantly disown it and act like I fucked up and uh it, it did some decent business um so i want to say it was probably mask of zorro and then followed by golden eye and i mean i definitely I'm just trying to remember what i saw in what order you know it's it's what's where it's a blur for me because i saw pretty much all the james bond movies back to back along with casino royals they were always being marathon on spike tv and amc and i had cousins who had dvds so <laughs> the rest is history um and that's how i saw it is uh, okay even better so bond marathon. yeah yeah and i mean don't get me wrong there were plenty of other movies and shows that would re-air a lot of the same stuff fx and the Fox channels would always re-air Vertical Limit. Um, Beyond Borders was on the movie channels. And again, the Zorro films were always on TV, just especially the first ones, always on something like TNT, uh, ABC Family. It was easy to where you could show it for a family and without getting afraid of what was being shown on screen being too intense. Um, but yeah, so I had fun kind of going through his... 80 shows which i always meant to see and then i finally had an excuse and i gotta say riley ace of spice might be just one of the best spy shows of all time <laughs> it's, it's practically the guy who was known for inspiring kind of uh ian fleming's work but yeah it was about a real life spy named Sidney riley who was a russian-born adventurer who uh worked for the united kingdom and the british empire and uh it just helped with the overthrow of various places like the Bolsheviks and written by Troy Kennedy Meyer and he did a lot of British TV, but he was mainly, he and Campbell just followed it up with the Edge of Darkness miniseries, which starred Bob Peck, who you might know as the game warden in the original Jurassic Park. And it seems like the Edge of Darkness miniseries was pretty well known. It just got replayed quite a lot, I guess, on PBS type channels. It, is an interesting cover-up story. It's just six very taut episodes as Joe Don Baker as well and a very unrecognizable uh, CIA guy with his own agenda. It has music by Eric Clapton and Michael Kamen and Joanna Wally is really good as the murdered daughter who keeps appearing to the main character in Visions telling him, don't avenge me, you know. And it's... It's just very emotional and exciting and just lots to chew on and not easy to watch either. You really got to be in that mood for a very dark vision. So why do you why do you think he is able to tackle all this gritty subject material that other people struggle to do? I think like to bring a little bit of realism to his films, even the ones that you could say are. The way Blackbuster Hollywood, like, he's yeah, he's very respectable production and... values because there's others who can only do certain kinds of tones, they can basically only do just sarcastic type remarks and just over the top yeah. action. They, they'll be damned if they do a serious movie, <laughs> <laughs> just they can't do it, or that's what they've been hired to do, and they haven't been able to successfully pull off a legit serious thing and it seems like he's one of the few who's able to have all these over the top aerial stunt work and helicopter camera work as well as set a mood of suspense he seems to be a suspense guy first and who happens to have all these fight scenes and occasional movies 
Uh, what, what would you say, Mark? Is just his yeah, name. I, I mean, there's like, there's just a certain um, feeling, like, like John said, like kind of realism. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, not not every scene in every film, but there's like a a believable quality, I'd say, to most of the action in his films. Um, and it's just, I don't know, there's just a certain style, um, you know, very limited CGI, even even in um, his recent stuff. Um, yeah, he seems to be one of the few who's using blanks, kind of like Fuqua, he's all about, and kind of playing with different elements. One minute he's mystery, the next minute he's a spy movie, but it, and then he's a revenge movie, and then he's a little dramatic. Um, yeah, and, I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like, there is a serious tone, kind of underlying. Um, I mean, my, my my top three are Goldeneye, Casino Royale, and The Foreigner. Um, Dolly. I mean, though, mm. all all three of those I thought were excellent. Um, in Protégé, definitely- I liked it. I, I definitely liked it. It was like, it was one of those films where I thought it was going to be little bit better but um you know he seems to be critical proof though i mean legit like critic proof because like his movies almost always seem to make decent bank and yeah i mean he's successfully like i mean this has been pointed out and people who aren't gonna like those generally just kind of don't instead of being the usual cynics will often just say hey i'm just not into action movies this story didn't really do anything for me but those who are actually carefully paying attention to his work tend to just say is like hey I, you like this kind of movie i think you're gonna really love this one like he successfully launched both of the last two james bond actors you know he did their first film so He's very meticulous. Yeah. He's very fascinating seeing the making of how he's all about just giving a fill and he's like I I would like it. I mean that would be awesome if, you know, if maybe they hired him to do the whoever they choose as James Bond, hey, why not hire him to do the next film? But I kind of doubt it, but you never know. I have a feeling they might cuz I know they trust him more than other directors. So he seems to just legit love putting on a spectacle without getting caught up in only how the stunts are done or only how the tension is. Or, And he seems to leave his actors alone. Like, he trusts them, so he doesn't... And John said you had some pretty cool stories about how he goes about casting people. You know, when, when the project came out, I thought legit, like, oh, you know, Maggie Q, she was in Nikita's show, Disney's writer, it makes sense, you know, it's like, no, he cast her because he saw her it's demo awesome. reel from yeah. a multi-character yeah. drama that no one saw, yeah. I'm like, oh, jeez, all right, so he sees something in someone when he, if he has any say in the casting. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't even know that she was trained by Jackie Chan, he was surprised when someone mentioned that to him in an interview, so... That I just found fascinating. Who answered that question? Well, he has a few other things that I unfortunately have not been able to see. He did a screen two, which is like the British equivalent of Masterpiece Theater, that version of Frankie and Johnny. He's done Charlie four part miniseries, and um, others might know the HBO TV film he did called Cast a Deadly Spell about a guy who basically encounters Lovecraftian type creatures in an alternate 1948. I did not know that. <laughs> it's a very unique film for him. because it's Yeah, it's like as writing. close as he got into the fantasy genre. Any other time, he's pretty fantasy much stuck horror, to... I would say. Right? <laughs> yeah. Which I love to see him do more of, to be fair. But, you know. I guess that's so, I mean... You know, it's just coincidental, I guess. Late, lately, I've been reading a lot. I mean, I came across an article just published this past summer about, you know, kind of the comparison, or not really comparison, but like the relationship between the, the video game, Goldeneye, and the film, you know. Oh, nice. <laughs> and 
pretty different, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, like, I, I'm sure, like, a lot of people, even though, you know, I, I, I knew about James Bond. I had probably seen, I know I had seen at least part of a movie on TV one time, you know, but it was really, you know, the Golden Eye game and that came out. And I when, when I first played it, I mean, like I was hooked. And and that game really it got me into the it really got me into the 007 world, you know, like Oh really? Uh, hmm. Yeah, I mean after I was like obsessed with the game, then of course I, I rented the movie on, on VHS and ever since then, you know, I I've been a big you didn't have any that. folks who were into it or anything? No, I mean I've you know I've watched, you know, if I say hey my parents or sister at the time like when when we were kids like hey do you want to watch these movies yeah they they would watch them but they weren't somebody who would watch them on their own time you know and oh, wow. they weren't somebody who would introduce them to me i i would be the one who said hey can we watch this you know but interesting <laughs> um, um yeah they were dad movies basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I mean, everyone had their favorite and much like all the various star treks and twilight zones of the world you pretty much even just the the robin hood and zoros you didn't know what you liked until you watched it and everyone had their own opinion and so you had to say well i still got to sit down and watch it <laughs> yeah the the only thing like i said before you know my sister had introduced me to bruce lee films yeah um so you were all into you know, just again practical action <laughs> yeah so i mean that kind of it opened up the floodgates and then uh i had a, a great friend named jp actually he's the one you know he had he had bought goldeneye the game when it came out and you know i would play it with him all the time until i got my own system and my own copy of the game but um i gotta give him credit for a little bit of the action film um like influencing me on on getting me like further into the genre you know with like Dolph Lundgren I remember I mean he he had this film called Joshua Tree <laughs> yeah, Army of One Army yeah. of One yeah I mean you know I was like 11 or 12 at the time and then you know just blown away you know i don't think i had seen a john woo film at that point um so that was like the first time seeing that that style of like obviously vic armstrong tried you know he, he admitted he tried to kind of reference john woo's style from like hard boiled and stuff so um, yeah totally he he's kind of interesting in that because everyone else was pretty much just imitating what they wanted. Uh, Anthony Hickox admitted that he basically just did when he was doing the movie, he was the go-to sci-fi horror guy for a while. And then when he started doing movies for like HBO, he's like, he did one that had where it was called full eclipse. And basically he was just him yeah. doing his parody of John Woo. <laughs> really yeah. Make that one. Yeah, but, I just find it funny how everyone evolves because there's some they start off they're literally just doing their best imitation and there's others like they're doing a bit of that like you can see a bit of John Woo and Michael Mann's work but for the most part you know he's still kind of just doing his typical dreamy shots and kind of like really Scott where he's doing his best to just set a mood and there's others who seem to just kind of evolve based on the times and day and the kinds of movies they're doing there's a funny uh trivia that i've, I've read it in a couple places so i imagine it's true but supposedly uh, john woo was at the uh they've been london premiere of joshua tree and vic armstrong said something to him about Hey, sorry, you know, I've kind of kind of stole from you in this movie. And then supposedly John Wu said, Oh, don't worry, I've been stealing from you for years. You know, <laughs> because of all Vic's stunt, you know, history and doing stunt work and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he, Vic Armstrong's definitely one of the best in the business, so oh definitely. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, what about you, Cam? I mean, did, did you ever play the golden eye game? Oh yeah. I, I went over to her friend's house and it was, it definitely much like star Wars. My love for James Bond was depicted in both the movies and the games. And it was definitely one of the top James Bond video games before they did a bunch of other ones that were really cool. Some of them were original missions using the likeness of whoever was portraying him at the time. And uh, it's cool that you bring up Vic Armstrong because, yeah, he's another one who was just known for being a big stunt coordinator, second unit director on the Bond films. And yeah, he did and uh, Indiana Jones. Tomorrow Never Dies. And I think he did Die Another Day. Yeah. Well, yeah, pretty much it. Throughout the rest of that run, he was the stunt coordinator, second unit <laughs> guy. And he joked how he just basically brought a lot of his Indiana Jones friends, including Terry Leonard, who was the, you know, swordsman in Raiders, the Lost Ark. And he basically was like, we went all full blown die hard on Tomorrow Never Dies. But um, yeah, no, I mean, Campbell is interesting because, like, he kind of, again, yeah. Castle Deadly Spell is a big fantasy movie that keeps getting rediscovered because it's a Lovecraftian thriller. Uh, any obscure movie that he's done, I've always been thankful to have checked out, even if I've been disappointed, but I haven't really been all that disappointed by his work. I Criminal Law is a really cool thriller that I often would just see get mentioned, but I got it mixed up with plenty of other movies that Gary Oldman and Kevin Bacon were in. But uh, I hate... Uh, Campbell also loves using a lot of bit part actors like Stuart Wilson is again yeah in both No Escape and La Mask of Zorro as the main villain he has Joe Don Baker in Edge of Darkness Criminal Law and as the CIA guy in the first two uh, James Bond movies so yeah it's interesting to seeing him use all these other supporting guys and always utilize them and I never feel left out or like he's too full of himself or like he just doesn't have a vision. Yeah. It seems like he's pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah. I think that's typically like the best, the best kind of director, you know, like um, at least, well, I shouldn't say at least for action film, I should say for any genre, but um, you know, somebody who's, who's really dedicated to their craft, you know, and, I mean, yeah, they probably know they're good at it, but they don't need to brag about it. They they let their work speak for themselves. So, right. <laughs> that usually makes the prize. Yeah, he seems very humble. Yeah, I, you know, a lot of those guys do. Um, John Woo, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure uh, Vic Armstrong comes across that way. In, in his interviews and stuff. Uh, the dude is hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, did you guys see Memory or not yet? I, I did. Uh, I'll, I'll let John go first on it. I had the chance to see it on an airplane recently. Yeah, that's, that's strange with Memory because that's one that I enjoyed up until we got to the ending, which I even told Cam this, that I felt was very rushed. At least that's how I felt with the ending. I'm not sure if that's how it goes in the original or. Yeah, I, it's kind of similar, but it's way more artistic, like Leon the Professional, you know. And I was really blown away by this one because I figured, okay, much like the protege now in Edge of Darkness, you know, Edge of Darkness film, it's pretty solid for what it is. It just kind of came out when Mel Gibson's scandals were erupting, so everyone kind of ignored it. But I, at that time, I was kind of like, well, that's good, but that doesn't really leave me with much else. He kind of takes down the conspiracy and dies in a hell of gunfire. And, you know, the miniseries was way more subtle in review, so I kind of prefer that version better. But yeah, Protégé was a good, and Foreigner were both on fire. You know, Foreigner was some slow buildup before getting to, sp you know, spy territory and Patriot Games type revenge and showing an emotional side of Jackie Chan and protege just had dynamite, you know, stunts, you know, I'm talking rappling kind, you know, and the uh, fire hose one. Yeah. And the fire hose total yeah. diehard move. But uh, memory, I was really digging this one because it wasn't just, let's see Liam Neeson take out the trash. It's like you, you feel for him because he 
he has a brother who has Alzheimer's and who doesn't even remember him. And then it delicately gets into this, you know, modern day trafficking thing without just being just, hey, you know, I'm going to go kill every trafficker. No, it's like, I'm going to take down this one untouchable syndicate, you know, and Monica Belushi is just so relentless and calm and <laughs> evil. And yeah, I, I still got to watch it because I, I okay, bought the Blu ray when it came out. Oh, okay. In well, July, I with the intention of watching it straight away, but unfortunately, been, I haven't gotten to it. So it's been pretty ignored. I, I don't, it hasn't been like mediocre per se, but I, it barely made any business. And I think it just came out of, I think it's just audience exhaustion, just like we've been seeing a lot of people talk smack about superhero movies that are out. And I, I'll be honest, I don't care. I'm done with it. But I, I'm <laughs> and other horror movies that are just kind of driving people up the walls because they're just not taking any more chances. I, I was just really pleasantly surprised because like Ray Stevenson is in this and he's really douchey and. I, I just instead of just being the billionth like heat or collateral or training day arc where you know people are doing a big cat and mouse face off i really dug how you got story you know of again a hitman who is changing his ethics and trying to take down again the uh the traffickers who were his former clients coincidentally and then you got the again FBI guys in uh, El Paso who also want revenge against these traffickers, and I, I just love plot A and plot B. They both align pretty well compared to say some of these other movies, which can't. They do a good job with the police work, but the gangster just isn't threatening enough, or vice versa. The gangster's fascinating, but the cops are just plot devices to just keep everyone in line and. I just really dug how they both just played off each other. And I, I find all the performances very unrecognizable. I actually dug the final plot of who the mystery assassin was. That's that's what did it for me. I was like, okay, really cool. I, I was thinking maybe I'm too uh, smarter than the average bear, but I actually did not expect that. I've <laughs> They seemed like they might go there, but oh, well, there you go. I It just seems like uh, just they took more risks with this as opposed to just get uncomfortable or just too self-indulgent because any other thing would have probably just spent too much time uh and just like it, it wasn't junky like say something like Columbiana or i don't know think of any other just bad revenge movie that's come out lately where you're just like okay that's just feels like a really bad 80s movie made it with today's you know digital lenses that doesn't really bring anything new to the table you'll forget it by you know lunchtime <laughs> it's just not that remarkable and this one i thought yeah i i you know this is a hot take but i'll put it in his top 10 i really took this one because it's just a different it's ironically i have a good track record of watching liam neeson movies on a plane the last movie i saw on a plane oh. was, <laughs> i saw run all night and once again he was a hitman he was playing against character and it had a bunch i i loved the whole criminal underworld that they built in that and the stunts run all night that one was good yeah uh, compared to the other ones where he's <clears throat> it's basically kind of like how bruce willis got into where he's playing or stallone they're playing rambo or john McClain, but it happens to be in a different you know Movie. yeah yeah i mean i yeah i kind of tuned out of the liam neeson stuff like um after you know taken like taken was great but then the sequels were not so great yeah. terrible. you know then it just seemed like every other film he was doing was kind of like i mean blacklight came out and john and i were hesitant to watch it because we saw the movie that the filmmaker had worked on before honest thief and we're like well this one I literally see, got i did see blacklight and that was very average just like that one Oh, well, so, yeah, I mean, I'll see it eventually, but it's going to be on a bad movie night, you know, it's not. That's one thing I'll give it, memories, even though I didn't love it, at least I can say Liam Neeson put in more performance compared to Black Lives. Would you just say, okay, just without giving it away, just the ending of just passing the torch, so to speak, or were, was it too grim for you, or? <laughs> well, no, that didn't bother me, it was more the way they handled one certain character at the very end. I just thought it felt rushed. All right. I, I, say, I just thought there was all this other care into it. Because like Ray Stevenson, you know, 
there's the Punisher. There's Titus from Rome, and he's kind of been wasted in a lot of movies. And I just was, I it didn't feel great. like a movie where I have to know the actors to love the movie because there's oh, there's yeah. movies like that too where you'll watch them and you're like, yeah, but without them, there's nothing here. Yeah, I, I didn't feel like it was them doing their billionth take on heat where i'm the pacino and you're the de niro you know <laughs> i didn't feel like it was that and it kind of reminded me of another movie that came out that has been wrongfully ignored uh destroyer with nicole kidman as the narc taking down a bunch of old people she knew while undercover while also stopping a bank heist and trying to get her chaotic dysfunctional family together it's a masterpiece but you know once again no one talks about it, which is a shame but it's I just thought it was like, okay, for once, you know, uh, that there, Neeson had a wonderful line and I got to say it, I, I'd be a miss. And it felt just so akin to some of the dry wit that I've heard uh, Michael Keaton make in the protege, as well as the various James Bond lines. And Campbell seems to be good at that. Just some mild sarcasm that doesn't feel too cute or like something that, you know, he doesn't do like a serious version of Commando and then insert a line that feels more welcome and say a Lethal Weapon movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. and Neeson walks in, he's got a guy in a headlock and you know a, head, a pistol oh, to his I head, about, yeah. and he says, and "The guy is like, oh, why are you here?" And he's like, "If I'm already here, he's like, I didn't do anything wrong." He's like, "If I'm here, then something is wrong." <laughs> or something like mm-hmm. that. And I, 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 I lost my shit at that. I was like, "That's perfect." The '80s and '90s are back. <laughs> Well, um, you know, let's talk about the foreigner for a minute, because um, I'm very I mean, hard to talk about subject matter, you know, and when's the last time, you know, Jackie Chan, he was always I mean, he was in movies with chaos in them, but very none of them that were like serious, serious. It was often just a violent version of Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. And here he is. Well, you know, uh, and the thing Jackie did, like, on a rare occasion, he would do something like um a little Shinoku bit more incident, serious like 19, Shinjuku incident uh, 1911 was really good that one uh war movie yeah that one i didn't i didn't like it but you're right it was it was a serious tone uh, we're the, um, for the dynamite toss but yeah i mean there's uh i mean even the last two police story movies he did took a very unexpected gritty you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Lime. the police story 2013, that's another one. And that and um, remember the 41 new police story is like it wasn't as successful as the 2013, but I was just like, yeah, was like here I mean, yeah. Pier- Pierce Brosnan's in it, but he's he's not the lead. He's the se- he's the second one and he's the bureaucrat who's keeping him in line because he knows who's going out and yep. avenging and he's speaking in his fluent, you know, Irish accent as opposed to, you know, americanized so it was it was different and we we, we talked about the movie coincidentally just uh, uh a week ago because cliff martinez's score is pretty engaging oh yeah it is yeah yep. especially i remember i mean you know i saw it in the theater that i mean that was I one i was like looking forward to so much um oh nice you know i remember it was it had to have been in in 2016 at some point i'm trying to remember 2017 yeah well no no yeah yeah that's when the film came out but um prior to the film coming out there was was a trailer okay oh yeah well even before the trailer came out there was this and you can find it on youtube i'm sure somewhere but there was uh you know being a big jackie chan fan that there had been some kind of jackie chan like um mashup of the trailer right it was like his four upcoming films at the time that they did like a little sneak preview mm. of it was um oh wow R- railroad tigers kung fu yoga i think skip trace and oh skip trace was so bad <laughs> so that was like the first time i had seen any footage of the foreigner and it was like when when jackie's in the kitchen with that silence i think it was yeah it was like a machine yeah. gun where he's like taking out the trash at the end you know it was like and you knew it was going to be something serious because of the plot and martin campbell and this and that but to get that first look at it it was like okay yeah this is going to be this is going to be wasn't good. it co-produced by another chinese company I yeah i think you're right i think i think um 
It wasn't Saban. I'm not sure if one out. of Jackie's companies was involved in the production okay. too or not. Um, let's look it up. Let's look it up. All right. I don't know if it was Sparkle Roll or the Foreigner, produced by Styx here in the U.S. and Wuzao Film Distribution, Netflix in the U.K. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but Wanda I think pictures. Film, yeah. Oh yeah, Wanda. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the film. I think it was great for Jackie Chan because, even without him, like it's just so taut. You feel this. You don't. It. It's just so natural. It's just really. Yeah, weird. I mean, it didn't. You're right. It didn't. It didn't have to be him. But I mean, specifically for him, and specifically in like a in a U.S. film. Um, and just, I mean, everyone was going to see it. You see that trailer, you see him disarm a guy with a shotgun in a kitchen. You're like, whoa, whoa, what, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you know, I'm and, so sorry it was actually his version of Taken. That's what I mean, that's I the knew. vibe my friends got from it, but they were, they were instantly sold on it. They just knew you, there's a no nonsense level to all of Campbell's films. He can't escape the spy and mystery tone of either edge of darkness or his bond films and um i think john you said he, he spoke a little more on the green lantern matter saying he's like never gonna do superheroes again yeah someone <laughs> asked him a question about that he they're like well, would you i would do green lantern too and he goes over my dead body so. <laughs> <laughs> and i i think well, anyone would be better if they you know because that really did fuck him up for a while. Everyone was like, hey, how to hit him run? What did he do after that? Oh, Green Lantern. Oh, that sucked. And people don't understand. They don't understand how producers can come in and fuck with anything. Yeah, They're yeah. just like, you still directed it. I'm like, well, you know, so there are some movies which are a shit show and you don't know what you have until the editing. And if you can't edit, then there's no way to rescue anything. People goof up. A hair piece is out of whack. Continuity is askewed. When 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 there's too many cooks in the kitchen, you're gonna get something that's doesn't look that just does not signify or justify the budget. So that's just that. I mean, people. Francis Ford Coppola has successfully shown that you can do a good movie regardless of whether or not you are invested in the material or not, if you're following all the right beats. You know, good shots, good scenery, good you know something that matters and there's just a lot of people who don't get that they just think oh well they i've seen people even go so far as to make a stupid remark like oh they wanted to make a bad movie i'm like no no <laughs> why would anyone do that Ah, <laughs> oh, tough crowd here um that's kind of bread to understand when they say that because it was like, like Wes craven was another one I get I was interfered by a bunch of producers for certain films. Mm -hmm. and, and that wasn't his fault. It was the producers. He screwed him over. Right. And even then, like, I gave him a pass compared to other people because I knew he believed in his visions, regardless yeah. of what came out. He didn't. There's so many other people who get shat on, and it's like, you see. It seems like some people just need a behind the scenes story or this want to blindly go off IMDb and say, well, you're good at, you're just as good as your last movie. I'm like, well, maybe yes, maybe not. <laughs> um, sorry, we kind of got distracted. No, but no, yeah, yeah. So you, you had the chance to see these in the theater. Uh, how was the Foley? If you don't mind me asking. <laughs> well, um, I thought it, you know, it definitely looked and sounded great. Um, it was just, you know, regular theater, obviously. Uh, it's called a, we got a chain up here called Celebration Cinema. Celebration. <laughs> so, I kind of like that name. <laughs> owned by Earth, Wind, and Fire. No, go ahead. <laughs> Let me surprise. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like a local, um, I, I, I think it's, it's uh, some guy named Jack Lopes or something like from here somewhere in Michigan. He had uh, he had like started this chain, you know. And but there's there's like quite a few of them around the state. I don't I don't know how far it goes. 
I'm not sure if it goes out of the state or not, but far uh, enough. <laughs> uh, they even have like over in Muskegon, there's a there's a drive-in theater that um, is like, I guess it's owned or operated by this chain. So as long as it's not mobsters, I'll support. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, but I mean, then no, it's going to turn into wait. an Inspector Tequila shoot out here. I couldn't wait to pick up The Foreigner on Blu-ray because, I mean, it was one of those films that like, it lived up to my expectations and, you know, it was, like, cool in many ways. I mean, it's it's Jackie Chan, it's Martin Campbell, Pierce Brosnan is doing his... Um, and the protege kind of did kind of weird business. It was kind of a word-of-mouth movie. Like, people would go in, yeah, it was. like, how was so-and-so? Oh, I'm going to see it next Friday. But that's the other thing. Everyone wants instant return, and they often will share those trailers on just not even on a Friday or a Saturday as often as it's like I say casually in the morning hours and I'm like okay if you wanted to do business you should really be playing it a lot like all the major channels maybe on a Super Bowl or something you know if you want to build up some hype and Plus, I don't think it at a bad time when Everything yeah, shut. The thumbs coming at the same time. Yeah, same like reason. Protege, we were still recovering from COVID, and we had too many superhero movies coming out that time. And then, uh, you know, with uh, the Foreigner, I don't know. Just about everyone I know, every martial arts pal I know, saw it opening day. That is for sure. I did. Oh, well, there you go. And like, yeah. Same with same with Protege. So, there you go. I I saw the Protege when it finally came onto Prime, and I enjoyed it very much. I. I hate how everyone seems to just act like you must always go opening day. It's like you will make your money back. And I know this shouldn't be like a Milos Foreman, you know, where you do a crowd pleaser like, you know, One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest and Man on the Moon and Amadeus and critics love your work, audiences love your work, but your movies just notoriously don't make money. And I would hate for that to happen to Campbell, you know. Um, John, you yeah. or you said uh, that you you checked out that Reddit when he was doing it live last summer. Yeah, because I asked him a question about the protege. Uh, did did he answer your question? He did. Oh, it nice. Was, it was about the final fight. I asked him how many days did it take to shoot that, and he said it was roughly two days at most. Okay, so that was interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I was just, checking. I it just out. hope nothing happens to him because I would hate for anyone, not. you know, to just because he already had to dig his way, you know, out of a hole with Green Lantern, you know. And I don't find it the worst, but it's pretty light. Like it's just very unremarkable. You you're thrust into all the. I think some of it's just the bad CGI, but the other stuff is just you don't know where anything is going, and then, you know. I don't think Ryan Reynolds was comfortable doing his comedy shtick in that one for whatever reason. It just wasn't again, it was kind of like Vampire in Brooklyn. <laughs> one minute yeah. you got Wes Craven terror and then the next minute you got Eddie Murphy saying, I'm going to do me and, and it kind of felt like that. Uh, did you ever see it, uh, Mark? <laughs> I know we've talked about it way too much. Green Lantern I did not see. You know, I've never, it's one of those films, uh, well, I haven't heard anything good about it, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, it's like. <laughs> it's funny never my been... sister and mom saw it in theaters and they're like, it was OK. And then afterwards, they're like, yeah, wasn't that the movie we saw that was kind of lame? It was just kind of a slow afterthought, like those who didn't mind it still just barely had anything nice to say about it when just in hindsight, when in review, because there are some movies like that you'll watch and you'll be like, I had a fun time. And then I think hard about it, like. It was kind of dog shit. You know? <laughs> That's happened to me quite a few times. Uh, but yeah, I mean, with all our other greats kind of making movies that kind of flop at the box office, like uh, The Irishman, you know, was pretty high critical score, but didn't make all that much money. And uh, I saw on that same flight on the way back, uh, West Side Story, and I was like, hey, you know, I love the original. It had some potential. And I love you, Spielberg, but uh, it's kind of, man just self-indulgent on needed yeah. remake <laughs> and so i hate i would hate for campbell to just get caught up in just some other just clusterfuck um and he seems to just fortunately pick a lot of these big enough productions that 
he gets half the budget of what he typically gets, but he doesn't get something that is just like, wow, no one got along. No one wanted to work on this. Right now his... I wonder. Um... Oh, go ahead, Ron. Oh, no, you go, you go ahead, John. Well, I was going to say, I know I read somewhere that he's apparently going to reteam with Millennium on a film with starring Eva Green somewhere, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. He's been attached oh, to a really? lot of things. He was attached to Unstoppable uh, before Tony Scott got it. He was attached to Hunter Killer, that Gerard Butler submarine movie before Donovan Marsh took over. I, I'm i sure he's kind of that guy. He is the B-movie guy who is like kind of like Antoine Fuqua. He's like, you can work for Lionsgate or you can work for Universal, but get it done on time. Uh, the only movie uh, that I, I just honestly got to say is I don't hate but it's just not great. It's very forgettable. And I know you looked at that Reddit and he said he was disappointed with the movie as well. It was a defenseless. Yeah. I saw it. I saw the cast. And oh, Barbara Hershey, Sam Shepard. Okay. Another witness protection, legal kind of movie. Okay. I like those kinds of movies. And I watched, you know, I got the VHS at a thrift store one day. And I was like, man, it's kind of just, man, this I fast forward for some of it. It was very extremely dull. And very what's funny too. is a TV edit of it was released on TPT. Why would you release a, D- really? a TV edit of a movie? <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of just a movie that's been forgotten and he seems to kind of forget it himself. But yeah, I I didn't hate it. Like it would never make the worst movies of all time, but it was just, it might as well have been a TV movie that, you know, it didn't go anywhere. It's just, I'm surprised it got a theatrical release. Um, I, I gotta say, in hindsight, though, Vertical Limit is like his thinnest script, probably that he's had. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. And I forgot Stuart Wilson's also in that, but I, I don't hate it. And don't get me wrong, it was on like several like worst movies of the year lists just because it was so unrealistic. But I kind of see why he was asked to do that. Is a return to more expensive mountain climbing stunt work <laughs> what would you sure. say you know probably like from a critic standpoint and an audience standpoint would you say casino royale is probably his best most loved film i would have to say so it's either that or golden eye now yeah. yes i want I, I i hate to say this but i've been seeing some people shit on golden eye more recently like i got that in like junior high and it was often by those who just grew up to, they're more gamers so than they are movie guys so they just never found the movie all that great which is wild because i mean yes it's james bond it is implausible but i'm invested in it and there's mm-hmm. some great henchmen in both these movies and uh, i mean if i had to complain i might say casino royal is a little long during the card game but that's i do kind of like that second half it. That's it. yeah uh, yeah, but, that's that's really the only negative thing about that. I think you only <laughs> noticed that on re- multiple rewatches, though. I mean, <laughs> you're so yeah, engaged. That's what, that's what my dad noticed when he saw it in the theater. Uh, the game. Well, and you had the honor of finally seeing Beyond Borders. I think Beyond Borders is just criminally ignored. It's uh, another just wartime drama. Uh, it has Angelina Jolie and Clive Owen as these Peace Corps guys who are Mm -hmm. uh and a great score by james horner and it's just showing how they get caught up in it and it may not be one that you remember but it is an interesting post salvador type movie that's very intriguing so john did did, um did you ever get into the golden eye game as well i did but my brothers had that game yeah okay so you had your share of getting (laughs) shot in the face yep yeah i think i'd have to go back and 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 find that that reddit again i I actually came across it recently when i um i don't don't know if i googled martin campbell or what but i i I saw you know the, the archive thing you know so i have to go back and look but I think I remember when I when he was doing it, I think somebody might have asked him if he'd ever played the game. And I, I think he said <laughs> I think he said he never played it. I think he did say that. I mean, many filmmakers and it's not to shit on them or anything, they're just not they're not gamers. They stay in their lane. 
it's kind of like how now we're seeing all these big time filmmakers helm a hit Emmy winning miniseries and all these other movie stars who are now getting paid 30 million an episode to do a big, you know, five season run. Like that's what Kevin Costner is getting fucking paid per episode of Yellowstone. No, no joke. <laughs> so 30 million an episode. And that's where the money is now. So everyone's, everyone's lifted off their preconceptions. And now I think after Sonic, people are now finally realizing, Hey, you can do a good movie off of a video game. It doesn't have to be something forgettable, like uncharted. <laughs> you, you can do a hell of a time. You can do something for everybody. And I think it's just like we were mentioning, I mean, we're, we're looking at the nineties, you know, Campbell could have easily been offered something like the rocketeer or the phantom and never worked again, you know, but he didn't, he was just kind of, he he just picked enough brains in his work on hit British TV and got, you know, after GoldenEye, he pretty much got offered every other blockbuster that everyone else passed on, and he was like the fifth one up. <laughs> you know, on IMDb, it actually said in the trivia that John Woo turned down the opportunity to direct GoldenEye. That's <laughs> so wild. <laughs> and then it's kind of interesting because he ended Isn't up Isn't he a big Bond fan? I thought he was. Mission Impossible 2. Yeah, he gets Mission Impossible 2, and then again, just Paramount edits it, has Final Cut approval. It's like, man, I mean, <laughs> there's so many people who would kill the... Spielberg still to this day wants to do a James Bond movie, and it's been denied. He's been cock-blocked by the Broccoli's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, yeah, I still... I, I didn't see No Time to Die. I'm sure probably you guys have seen it. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. I have seen it. Unfortunately, the, the ending got spoiled for me. On, on yeah, that's kind of it. I was just like, I'm kind of done with Bond, and if he's gonna <laughs> just die, then I'm just like, yeah. yeah, that was just one of many problems I had with that. You know? <laughs> I, I did hear the villain was pretty lame, and I say that as a Remy Malik fan, I was just like, yeah, really under underwritten. That's why I call him. Yeah, it was <laughs> like, I mean. At the end of the day, I mean, I've seen James Bond so much, I kind of just cherish the memories. And Golden Eye just set a new bar of how you could have, again, you know, a guy who was meant to be Bond originally actually kind of just have fun with the role and be slick. And the set, uh, the sex in the in Campbell's Bond films isn't as over the top as some of the other ones, where it's just a guy's fantasy and takes yeah. off half the runtime. <laughs> which makes it even more awkward watching it, you know, with family. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he, he has great villains in both of them, you know, both Sean Bean, you know, he just was fresh off Patriot games, another Tom Clancy franchise, you know, another spy movie franchise. And he was just so menacing as traitor, Alex Trevelin, 006 in golden eye. And then to have Mads Mikkelsen, he's so associated with the role of the Chiffrey. So if anything, Campbell can say, he got to direct some very powerful performances in any movie he's done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, like, you know, I'm sure it's different for everybody, you know, and, and probably whoever... No, it's not. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> probably whoever, whoever had Goldeneye as their first, you know, full Bond film, probably they'll feel that special attachment to it or whatnot. I mean... The only but ones who like, I've seen who hate it seem to be ones who just, I don't know, just always hated Brosnan or just... They hate the score. I know that's one thing people hate is the score. I do I see know. people hate on the Eric Serra score, and I'm like, I mean, it's different, but it's not one that I think is out of place, but I don't know. I I mean, I've got, you know, like, one of my good friends, he, he hates on the movie, but he loves Casino Royale. You know, I think it's like... <laughs> And even even my wife, I I showed her both. Um, she's she had never seen a Bond film, so last summer I showed her Casino Royale, and then I showed her Goldeneye. Oh, nice! And she also yeah. said, yeah, you know, she she liked Casino Royale a lot better. Um, I guess it could just be datedness. I don't know. I, I yeah, guess. I'm not quite sure. Um, it seems you know, like some people say Goldeneye is too cartoonish, but. I don't really think it, it didn't really feel that cartoony to me. But it's not it's cartoonish not compared cartoonish to Sun Roger Bond. Moore. If anything, yeah. it's still pretty engaging. And I mean, that's basically where the franchise does definitely feels more like 
uh, shall we say, kind of diehard. <laughs> All those other uh, just giant blockbusters. Yeah. The action scenes, you know, I mean, that's something Martin the, Campbell, obviously, he excels at, like... The tank chase is very exhilarating. Chase, I love them. Yeah, yeah the tank chase, I mean, um, all, all of, like, the... All of the gunplay parts of the film and just... I mean, you know, it's like... Um, he has his characters the, being very blunt, and they always feel like mm-hmm. they are mismatched, and yet they excel at that. I, I have yet to see a performance where I'm like, that just doesn't fit. Or uh, I never feel he never comes off as workmanlike. And I know a lot of people of his type often get placed in those kinds of things where they just let the cameras roll and try to get everything done on time. <laughs> right. <laughs> With yeah. no creative license or any signature style or sense that they actually want to be making this movie, you know? There's some no, of those that you watch think... and you're like, they've pretty much got a competent crew and they just lucked out. And then everyone wonders when they finally make a dud, oh, why why did that suck? Oh, because... <laughs> I think Martin Campbell, um, I get the sense that he, you know, he cares about what he's doing and and he... Never anything where he's you're He's dedicated like, to his craft is, is, is my take on it, you know? If you were to ask him That's what he was thinking, he could definitely give a legit answer as opposed to be someone who i don't know what we were making (laughs) (laughs) even yeah like you said earlier the mask of zorro i mean that you know those are films too like you said like legend uh, of zorro is kind of weak but at the same time it kind of made sense that he kind of had to come back and do that he was kind of being the franchise guy there briefly and i mean he understood it he understood how to i mean when he has stuff in his movies that aren't working, he kind of just still lets it on full naturally. Like, again, Anthony Hopkins is not Spanish, but he's really good in the role. Uh, same thing yeah. uh, when I was watching Riley Ace of Spies, uh, David Suchet, you know, Perrett, <laughs> bad guy in his negative decision. You guys know David Suchet. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> he's playing an Asian character. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and. Gives a really good performance, and he seems to just kind of do quick edits of everything and just let it unfold naturally, as a, instead of other guys who kind of just run into all kinds of peculiar, just bizarre decision making where you just don't. If he's gonna have something that unfolds, he's gonna still probably work very heavily with the performers and with his cinematographers on getting what he needs compared to some of these other guys who seem to just kind of get fucked. They really do, because there's so many guys who you'll watch and you're like, what happened to them? What happened to all the Russell Mulcahy's or, um, you know, whoever's of the world? <laughs> it's like, they kind of just made, had too many idiot producers casting, you know, people who were the go-to for investors, but not good for the roles he seems to somehow avoid a lot of the other than green liner and avoid a lot of these just office politics <laughs> yeah yeah because there's others is like you'll, you'll ask certain comedians is like what were you thinking at that time you're like i don't know ask me tomorrow <laughs> i i was there but i don't remember everything and he seems to be have a pretty big picture memory <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm not surprised that he hasn't played the Golden Eye game. He seems like a kind of guy who just watches a good movie and says, "I want to do." That's um, what I'm inspired by. <laughs> well, um, something I was gonna say, I I just read it recently. I, I probably read it a long time ago and forgot about it. But you know, one thing I did notice, it was probably. You noticed? No, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> it was probably, you know, the second or third time that I that I watched Goldeneye, you know, because you know, first I saw it on VHS and then it's a hell of a fun time. You're gonna take it out because you either like that Vaughn outing or want to introduce it to friends or want something that you know will invest you but won't be heavy, heavy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, then I then I bought the DVD and, and you know watched that and then I watched it again at some point and you know that probably was like that third time that I noticed okay 
um, the the sets in the film, some of the sets, it's like the the video game has it almost exactly how it is. And then <laughs> then I read that they actually the company Rare who made the game they actually visited the set. That makes sense. I that makes and sense. was the yeah. same way with Star Wars games where I would. You pretty much hear the full on cut John Williams scores half the time when you're playing those games that you only hear like maybe a segment of in the final cut of those movies. So, yeah, it's the same thing with Bond where you're just like and even later ones, I feel like kind of like. So if there's anything kind of like how every Bond video game, like especially everything or nothing. And uh-huh. Nightfire had to be try and be the next GoldenEye game. It was like. Everyone pretty much from that point on is like, you got to make it like Campbell's, uh, you know, Goldeneye. Because don't get me wrong, there's plenty of other ones that people liked, but not necessarily at the time. Like Dalton's films were criminally ignored. Some of the ones that more did that most audiences generally liked, like The Spy Who Loved Me or For Your Eyes Only, just got ignored by all his goofier outings. And it's kind of just one of those things. It's like, so it is cool that he had two, uh, you know, rendezvous with bond and then yeah yeah and yeah. most of these movies have been pretty well liked by audiences instead of just being i saw it but it was just okay or it was just good but i don't remember it you know uh fortunately enough i think a lot of people did remember the foreigner and the protege uh, especially genre fans i uh, definitely uh, out of the movies that audiences like i definitely saw those being pretty well ranked on certain sites so i yeah, the foreigner was they, they made they definitely made ta- they, they made taken equalizer John Wick money. They definitely did. <laughs> it's just how can you compete with even equalizer or John Wick? You know, those are big uh, yeah. cash flows for both Sony it, and Lionsgate. So to me, it, 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 that film seemed like it it didn't disrespect Jackie Chan, right? It, it yeah, it, it didn't exploit no. him. It presented him to, because, you know, I think the the average, well, I I don't know, it's hard to say, but I think the most people on the street that you talk to, they they probably would associate Jackie with only, like, comedic action and that kind Mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, Yeah, just stuff like that where you're like, uh, okay. (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, if you go back, like, like you said, like, in this Hong Kong, uh, at the peak of his career, really back in like the eighties or, or, you know, from like project a or police story onward until he did rush hour. Um, I mean, I wonder what made him say, uh, you know, yes to this project. What was it? I couldn't find anything. If he said he loved the scripts or if he trusted the director, but I guess somebody must've said something, you know, obviously the only, I think I'm yes. saying in the interview that he loved the scripts. All right, so there you go. And but I wonder what made him say, "I'm going to trust someone like Campbell." Was it just knowing his work? Or I read one thing that he said to Campbell, like, you know, because Jackie, uh, as you know, I mean, he, most of his films aren't that violent. I mean, that they're, they're no. a Not lot of action. Super, but... super cop free is fucking yeah, rated R, and is. It's harmless. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah. some of some of those films back in the day, they had some blood squibs and and some some yeah. Killing or uh, Armor of God has someone get shot in like yeah. glasses, yeah. and you're yeah. like, if that's as violent to, to suffice an R, that, that's silly. That should be a PG-13. <laughs> yeah, I mean Rumble in the Bronx, it, it had an R rating, but it wasn't. I think it's very... because of the grinder thing but yeah it's always yeah, the grind moments and where people it. freak out <laughs> and the guy takes his pants down and jackie like whips him in the ass with that car antenna <laughs> i guess that that might be it <laughs> but, I do and you know they that, said though. the f word a few times or whatever but yeah typically his films have been you know um not hard r violence and i guess he told campbell like you know i i don't mind it being rated r but don't make it too violent or something like that yeah so. don't make it to where i'm exploited and i know he didn't talk about it a lot but he was ve- like many hong kong actors he was disappointed by some of his american efforts even though he was probably way more successful than a lot of the other ones you know especially compared to chow young fat and Jet Li. and it was just one of those it was like okay i get it you're pretty close to the work and there are some movies that 
I, I know as many people who love Rush Hour as the ones who hate it, you know, so it's like, and I guess Campbell must have just, you know, uh, been well pitched. And I mean, again, the story was there and you, know, you never feel like the movie is on autopilot or just struggling to get to the end of the roster, to the end of the tunnel. So it's, it is a dynamite, pretty fast paced yeah. movie. Yeah. And, you know, I agree. I mean, like you said, I mean, for any of those Hong Kong actors who who tried a uh, Hollywood career, I mean, first of all, I'd say, I mean, obviously Jackie's tried a few times back back in the 80s and then finally where he really broke through in, in with Rush Hour. But at first he was kind of on fire. I mean, Rush Hour 1 and 2 were, were great, a lot of fun. Um, Rush Hour 3 was very poor, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, after that one, I was like, and then he did a few other ones with people who I grew up liking to see his collaborations with. He and Stanley Tong did this pretty bizarre fantasy adventure movie called The Myth. It was not good. <laughs> it was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Stanley Tong, I mean, to me, they're a great pair because they made, you know, three three classic films in the 90s, really. I mean, Police mm-hmm. Story 3, Super Cop rumble in the bronx and first strike i mean yeah apart from drunken master too i'd say those are like probably jackie's best um films oh, of the yeah. drunken master 2 is so great and so many people like to shit on that one now i'm like why what is wrong with it i don't see anything wrong with it but you know what i did even though we're getting off topic from martin campbell oh, but we'll, stanley we'll tong yeah. stanley tong you know i mean the, their last film, a lot of people didn't like it, but I, I thought it, I thought it was entertaining. Vanguard, Which one was that? Vanguard. Oh, yeah, I Vanguard. Yeah. Yeah, and didn't you like that one, John? I remember not minding it. I remember. I mean, I've only seen that one time, so I had yeah. to probably go back and. Yeah, I mean, it, I thought it was, it was more entertaining than the myth or kung fu yoga i, mean, well, I haven't seen kung fu yoga what's the one with uh bleeding steel or something like that oh god yeah that was pitiful that one i didn't see that one that, it was like a mainland film yeah that and this other one that involved time travel that had andy lau it seemed like there's just like an increase in just bizarre just really bad like yeah <laughs> mashups of like unleashed meets like <laughs> time cop and you're just like what is going on um <laughs> bad by any standard bad by any production bad by any uh translation um yeah i mean campbell just seems to just i think he's fortunate because there's so many of these other filmmakers who have kind of just stayed in their country they've only done those kinds of productions and he's been able to travel the globe for all these kinds of productions <laughs> yeah uh, with all these big giant stars and I, I think he'll continue it uh, it's just a shame that when he does do a movie that is good it kind of just gets ignored but uh, you know I think he's earned enough respect from genre buffs I don't think anyone and he's again he's a legit critics don't knock him because they, they've they seen his TV work and earlier efforts so they like him <laughs> and I, I have yet to see a review that says oh Campbell doesn't know what he's doing or he he's very limited he's asleep at the wheel i have yet to see anyone make that because i think somebody about said that but if they were if it was it was probably vertical limit because why not hate on vertical limit a silly cliffhanger type blockbuster movie but i mean if his gimmick is too silly for its own good he usually kind of just still just focuses on creating suspense and i I got to applaud him for that because there's so many other filmmakers who just nowadays just vary by movie. There's this one guy who's been working on every other blockbuster The Rock is doing, and those efforts are always mixed. Sometimes they're funner when Alan fun, and other times they're a bit of a slog. So, I mean, and again, I've seen other people, it seems like Campbell is the British or New Zealand. Uh, so there, there's the other thing. It's like he's a New Zealand guy, but he's worked in Britain. So does anyone know the history of that? I don't know, actually. <laughs> Seems like so no... much is known about his work and very little about the man. I guess that's one hell of a way to go about it. <laughs> I know he's actually, he's also like surprisingly 
older than than I would have guessed originally. Uh, I mean, he's like, I think he's like seventy seven or something like uh, that. Let's look it up. Yeah, let's look it up. Holy shit, seventy eight. 78 or 80? 78. Well, you know, I saw the protege back. Um, I couldn't make it to the theater for that one. And I asked my wife, hey, you know, please buy me the Blu-ray for Christmas. So <laughs> uh, so we watched that one, you know, just right after Christmas. And, and it seems like he's avoided a lot of just bullshit in general. Like he was attached to like a Birds remake. I'm glad he didn't have to do it. I'm sure he would have done a decent job, but, you know. Oh, he's attached to that. <laughs> wow. Well, I was surprised, like, how quick, um, you know, next thing I know, it, memory's coming out. You know what I mean? It's like, right. wow, he's got a, a new film out already. And now, yeah, I think just, he's kind of showing that right before he started the interview's protege. I think so. I, and I think that's whatever deal he worked out, he was just able to just convince people, hey, yeah, I know you love these James Bond movies. I can give you. It helps that he's worked in two decades worth of them. So he's it, two, and both that happen to be considered the best ones, like both, by both critics and audiences. So, I mean, of the whatever era they're in. So, I mean, uh, yeah, he's picked enough brains. And I think it just, didn't you say, John, he also just pissed some other people off on Green Lantern? Because, I mean, he did go out on the record. He did not keep silent. And, good on him you know i respect that but at the same time that often studio guys will say oh you're the reason the movie sucks because you're bad press you know but now he was I, mad that they cast ryan reynolds because he wanted bradley cooper for that role so eh, he well, it's pretty bad that he had to direct ryan reynolds i him. could have gone without either version of that fucking movie but <laughs> i know what you mean i know what you mean it, it but it I, I mean i've heard so many comedians when they're on shows that didn't take off that often producers would give notes say they, they killed they're the reason it didn't make it to air it didn't make it to pilot <laughs> and so i think a, a lot of that does seem to transpire with these filmmakers when something just doesn't turn out that studios want a scapegoat and it's always the director and uh but see compared to other ones i mean even the ones who I love, they've occasionally had a easily avoidable like line of dialogue that's unneeded or a plot hole that came up or a cliche, happy, implausible ending. Everyone we know has done eventually just too many rewrites and that's just what ends up in the can. But I, I can't think of any of his movies that are just like Phil just, you know, other than Green Lantern, which I don't count because again, he was denied final cut and yep. uh it seems like they released an unrated version which did very little difference it just had extra exposition so i mean uh i i it seems like he's just a very private guy and i'd love to see more behind the scenes documentaries because let's be honest the casino royal making of spe uh, special features were so such a blast you know when i first got the disc and then they would show those special features on channels like HD net, which would show a lot of special features. And it was always just dynamite, just seeing it in motion, a man who's orchestrating all kinds of things that have to take place for some kind of epic story. I, cause there's other guys who, again, they, they can do a junkie movie, you know, they can do a Stallone ish type movie, but they can't do a <laughs> legit, like he seems to be kind of like Walter Hill. He knows how to do the nitty and the gritty and, just loves cinema and directors aren't quick to say well he only will appeal to action buffs and audiences don't feel like they're just action movies either so i mean clearly some the best people are the ones who can go beyond their genres go beyond their expectations and go beyond he's he's always surprises me. he always has a different type of cast and even when he's reused actors they're often the support they're not I'm going to use the exact same lead in every movie. I'm going to pull a De Niro DiCaprio in every Scorsese movie. He's, he's not that kind of guy either. <laughs> um, That's true. Who do you guys, who would you guys want to see as the next Bond? Ooh. Oh. Um. Uh, cast me just some unknown British guy who's got a hit TV show right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might not be a bad idea. I don't uh, really have because uh, there's I mean, so have, many who would have worked fantasy one for one person i told cameras before 
I said Henry Cavill was my choice originally. I would have done Ian um, e. McGregor or Hugh Jackman back in the day, but yeah, Clive Owen would have been cool. But they, they, they that that ship sells. So I mean, uh, if you if there's some guy who's just who's thirty something, not not quite to their forties or fifties yet, who would be down? I I'm cool with that. I. I have faith in Amazon. I know that's controversial to say, but, you know, seeing how they've seized all these assets from all, you know, their continuing shows that got canceled, like American Rust from Showtime and Sci-Fi's The Expanse, and then doing all, you know, they've done their new Lord of the Rings thing, and it's turning out pretty good, despite so many people who haven't seen it, who were never going to see it, you know, because how dare you do a different version of a popular book, you know, 10 years later. (laughs) <laughs> how dare you they, sir they bought mgm right yeah they did. I, yeah yeah so that tells you the mgm vault wasn't wasn't much but i i you know given what they've done with other stuff like reacher and bosch i and even other experimental stuff uh like electric dreams i i have faith in them i think they they are you know much they and apple i know they're giant corporations with infamous figures attached but i i, I think they are going to definitely uh, try and find again, you know, writing talents that are trustworthy, and they will throw money at something if they just know they can get some decent sized views. And I, I, th- you know, if Bond movies start just being streaming only, I'm cool with that too. I, I mean, Prey has demonstrated that there's still life in the you know Predator franchise. So I mean, <laughs> and same thing with Campbell. If he does a movie that is streaming only, I'm not gonna ever be like, oof must have been a shit show because you know netflix has been doing that lately where they, they they're practically direct video they only want you your movie to go straight to streaming they don't want to spend anything on advertising or theater play except and, for yeah. glass onion kind of like that's going to theaters before it hits netflix so oh that's just it yeah unless they want to sneak in an award possible nom but yeah and but see the Academy's not doing any of those tricks and people really are just loving shows that they can binge watch because or and or movies that do have a theatrical moment but they can see it now in their great you know hd tv you know 1080 4k i don't have any problem with you know stuff debuting on like a streaming site or whatever i mean it's kind of I mean, you know, we probably all grew up seeing films in the theater, but the the only thing I have an an issue with is when they never release a film on uh, physical format, and that's a bother. Denying physical format is worrisome. Uh, Also, just the movie comes out and there's not even a trailer. That's when I'm like, wow, you threw it away. And, yeah, and I mean, that, like that's what we're talking about. Because like we would see yeah. movies like Gunpowder Milkshake and a bunch of other ones, and it just looked like there was a lot of rough red camera edits and cheaply shot in like Atlanta or New Orleans. And you're like, oh come on! But I, th- there are other ones that do have some pretty good production value and have been hits for whatever streaming platform they're on. I just, I, I just hope whatever they do, like the money shows on the screen, and they do pick someone pretty likable and. I hope they go with even a different tone. I think everyone, because that's what's been unique about Bond, it has been picking a different tone and mood every movie, you know? And sure. so I, yeah. I, 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 I don't doubt you guys. I would not be surprised if Campbell gets called back one more time to start off the show. I wouldn't even be surprised if they even do a seven-part miniseries. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, we'll wait and see. I mean, uh, I also Campbell's... I wouldn't be surprised if 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 maybe they just um, take a long break either. But I think they want to because you know they collected so many earnings. Two or three years. They they lost so much just from COVID and refusing to reschedule No Time to Die. So I think that's just it. I think, and I think that's just that's how what they're doing with every franchise now is like okay. Uh, I've milked it, bring it back when everyone finally says, I want more, you know, kind of like with these TV revivals they've been doing recently is like, uh, start 
circulating the message boards and then you know like indiana jones 5 is coming out i'm already pumped after seeing harrison ford actually attend the convention and getting james mangold in the director's chair and mangold i think is another one who kind of like campbell he's done all kinds of movies and even if i haven't liked it i've admired his dedication to echoing you know truly clearly a man who's in, been watching movies you know from the 30s to now and yeah. has a sense for art direction good performances passionate storytelling and any kind of genre i mean he kind of like campbell he'll he's mainly kind of a mystery action guy but every once in a while he'll do a little bio a bio ugh, i can't speak today a dramatic bio or a horror uh, mystery that freaks everyone out and i'm like wow that's awesome and i uh, yeah, it, it seems like they're a dying breed, but they're still out there. They're definitely out there because there's definitely an audience for them. And it seems like for a while we were having some of these guys like appear with A24 and the now defunct Cine State, but they kind of got pushed to the side because they had some scandals and uh, bigger than both Weinstein and Kevin Spacey's pockets. But um, yeah, no, I, I think like you guys say that Amazon's going to, be experimental and Campbell's going to probably get another shot. I can't imagine why you wouldn't. I mean, just about every filmmaker who was, who did a lot of James Bond movies like Terrence Young or John Glenn often got dibs on doing another one. <laughs> it was first one to be called up saying, I trust you with this. Let's sit down and talk, you know? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, and like you say, I mean, much like John Woo and Armstrong, they, again, these aren't just genre filmmakers you know campbell is again like all the other guys we've been talking about they're they love movies they love all kinds of adventure and they love uh having actors portray you know not necessarily bizarre but just uncanny characters that are tough to uh to put down on paper and you know just if there's any signature style he's got he you know he what he does especially well i would say is he always gives his villain reasonable screen uh scenery chewing and sometimes he doesn't sometimes he doesn't have any of that in memory or the foreigner but he's got a bit of scenery chewing in both the protege you know obviously the bond films and the mask of zorro film so i mean it whatever he they're all the kinds who they don't want to do the same movie every time and at the same time they do want to cater to the same kind of audience as well so i mean they want to surprise you any chance they get and at the same time they're also cool with doing a little bit of replication and then they naturally they change it up here and there and he's worked with some good cinematographers and stunt coordinators and even makeup and uh just uh screenplays so i can't imagine i, I haven't heard anything about him being a horse's ass or uh, on imaginatives and <laughs> definitely doesn't show on screen i'll just say that so <laughs> other than green lantern <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then again you know like that's a movie anyone could have made and it was kind of a cowboys and aliens kind of movie where you're just like a lot of people were or the legend of tarzan where you're like i've seen these guys all this cast and crew work on better stuff uh that's been better i've seen these actors i and other stuff i know they can act but uh, clearly not in this outing <laughs> uh, and i think we're just we're too spoiled we got too many audiences who just seem to think oh you did a good job what's to stop you from doing your best job ever you know next time <laughs> it's like if people play around it, it doesn't matter how much money you got it something's going to come collapsing uh, i have yet to see any talk of him having actors who were difficult to work with or arguing over script rewrites or it seems like he often has everything pretty much set in stone and he just naturally from that point on just tells his gaffers and lenser lensers to you know photograph something suspenseful for the opening credits so that's <laughs> off to him I, I i look forward to his next movies and even any yeah. movie and, and once yeah. again even if you want to shit on vertical limit or no escape they are they are just literally a product of their time uh, i would compare them to even lewis teague who's done movies like navy sills and cujo you know even if i haven't liked his movies he is a genre specialist and i think 
now that people are craving that people from the 80s and 90s work on some of their favorite movies and shows now i mean there's a love for other people like stephen hopkins and uh anthony hickox and uh even joe dante and you know sam raimi did a comeback with dr strange too and it was great because it was hardly what i would even call a marvel movie it was a sam raimi movie you know when people just come back and just give you the goods of what they're known for doing then you're set for life you know <laughs> i yeah. i I can't stress that enough. I was worried, just like John, where I'm like, okay, it just feels like they're just doing the billion sequel. But I was like, okay, it's an Evil Dead mummy movie with Benedict as guest starring as Doctor Strange. That's what it is. <laughs> I, I think a lot of other ones that they're getting tired of it. Like my sister showed me an article where Dennis Vanov and you know a Prisoner's Arrival, Blade Runner two, and uh, Sicario was getting into into a Twitter war with uh, you no know, Blancom, you know, from Elysium and District 9. Uh, long story short, you know, Dennis was getting fucking tired of Marvel movies and, and Neil was like, fuck you, I love Marvel movies. <laughs> and, and it was just like, uh, his actual words, no, nah, fuck off, I love those movies. And it was just like, she wanted me to pick a side and I was like, I love them both. They're both multi-genre people who have done all kinds of styles much like the Soderbergs and Tony Scott's The World and they're not uh, you know, Blonde Cop if he wants to, I can see him becoming another James Cameron if he if that's what he wants to do is like, I am I do movies that are love letter James Cameron, let him do that. If the knob wants to do another movie with war criminals or serial killers or uh, just intense dystopians that and go for it i'm we can't just dislike or like every single filmmaker after a while there are some who are able to break through any kind of barrier and i, I applauded campbell for doing that because man i don't think any critic like hated these last three movies he did but they didn't love him either and at the same time audiences seem to really like him so i mean if he can keep going through and making all these movies that people can watch, even if it's not Casino Royal, I think people are going to have a fun time. He's definitely going to make Equalizer John Wick type money. Because now I'm seeing people shit on John Wick now. You know, so I'm like, of seriously, course. you loved it at the time. What's what what changed five years ago? I, it's like people want an answer then and there. <laughs> I mean. Am I just seeing too much cynicism? I, I just, I do not get it. You, some movies do take time to just kind of soak up and enjoy. I mean, just about every movie on the top 250 on IMDb was hated at the time. That's true. <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life. Hate to break it to you guys. Before it was a TV Christmas classic, it, it flopped and was instantly forgotten about. So, I mean, people just need to just kind of just chill, I think, and because I'm just seeing them regurgitate. They just seem to... It used to be, I saw it at a drive-in and rented it all the time at the video store. It's a favorite. And now it's, is it on physical or is it on streaming? It's like, well, you can have both. <laughs> What's your mood? <laughs> and, and I think everyone is tired of just... They either want one or the other. They don't want multiple options. It's like, well, it's okay to offer multiple options. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. as long as the the options there, I'd rather have you know options I mean? than nothing at all, <laughs> um, or just one thing and it's just all wrong sauce. You know, it's just like <laughs> uh, it's just it gets annoying when they when when certain um, films like it's they say well you know this probably never will come out on Blu-ray or whatever, but right or we can't even like, put it on streaming because. Oh, uh, there's a music rights issue or some bogus excuse, which just means it's just not. We know you love it, but we don't want to give our consumers what they want. So, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't be in favor if Amazon announced, hey, you know, Double O Seven from now on, not going to come out on Blu-ray anymore, only on uh, Amazon Prime. You know. 
I think that would be pretty pretty lame. I think it'll piss people off, but I doubt they'll do that. So. Yeah, not no, even they will. as arrogant as Paramount has been. Not even they have been that dumb. <laughs> Just about all the shows that are on streaming are eventually going to get a Blu-ray release. Oh, he wants yeah. his Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, my son wants he wants Give me Mark Campbell to direct the next Bond, and he wants it on Blu-ray when he's right. three. <laughs> so it's you got you got two years. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, we got two years. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jackpot.